Um, I, I meant to tell you, read to verse 9. That's my bad. <laughs> uh, but good, mo- good morning. <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, it's good to see all of you this morning. I am grateful that my wife is here. Um, she was here last week, as you know. But uh, just having her at church is a blessing. As many of you know, what, some of what she's been through over the last few weeks and months. And uh, I am just blessed to be married to this woman who is in my opinion, the strongest woman I know. Um, As you know, she had a a tumor removed from her brain in January. And uh, this past week, she just finished uh, radiation treatments uh, to that area. And, you know, she had some, you know, uh, setbacks here and there. But I praise God that today that she is with us and she's getting stronger and better daily. And uh, so thank you all for all of your prayers for her and for us. Uh, I'm also grateful that my son is here. And so those of you that know about what happened at the Capitol on the 6th, well, my son is in the military, and he's been one of those people that were there. uh, And he has been there since now. They just got, uh, they just released them, uh, what, two days ago, three days ago, two days ago. And so we hadn't uh, seen him. I mean, he lives in Virginia anyway, but we hadn't seen him uh, um, since uh, Christmas. So I'm just happy that he's here and he's alive. Because if you were following the media, you would have thought that uh, everything, like hell would have caught, broken loose at the Capitol and that uh, everybody would be shooting one another and so on. And so I just want to say to you, today I'm going to be speaking to you about being a peacemaker. And, and as a side note, this wasn't part of my plan, but since I mentioned what I did about my son, if you're going to follow Jesus' command and receive his blessing, uh, the blessing of peace making, then one of the things that you probably want to do is watch less news, less media, less social media. Be very careful. So that's going to be my, uh, my, my talk today is, uh, <laughs> my topic today is, are you a peacemaker? Are you a peacemaker? That is our question that needs to be answered. Now, I want to tell you at the outset that the Beatitudes are some of the most popular portions of the Bible. It's right up there with the Lord is my shepherd. It's right up there with 1 Corinthians 13, which is what many call the love chapter. But the reality is, very few people understand what Jesus means by these beatitudes, and very few live them. Very few understand what they mean and very few live them. And you say, how can you say that? Because Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that will find that narrow way. So we can deduce from that truth that if few will find a narrow way and whatever the Beatitudes are, they are characteristics or the attributes of those who have found the narrow way. They are in the narrow way. Then we can conclude that to be a peacemaker is not something easy to be. It is a serious thing, I'll show you this morning. It is also unnatural to be a peacemaker. It is not natural to be a peacemaker. It is something that requires a supernatural work of God in the heart of a human being so that we can be peacemakers. Now a question I want to begin with is, my question to you is, and this is rhetorical, how many of you love confusion? How many of you like contention and strife in your home, in the workplace, in your nation, in your community, in your neighborhood? Most of us don't. I'd say most people don't like that. And yet, our world is filled with confusion, contention, strife. Don't be surprised by this. I say this is unnatural to be a peacemaker If we just go through the Bible, trace through the Bible a little bit. Genesis chapter 6. God says he is going to destroy the world. Why? Because in the heart of man is violence continually. There's violence throughout the earth. The earth has been corrupted. The earth has been polluted. Why? Because out of the heart of man is murder and hatred and conflict and envy and unforgiveness. All these things start from within and they they become a manifestation in earthly living or living for all of us. And in Genesis, sadly, God had to destroy the earth. And you would think by the time we get through Genesis 6, 
to chapter 8 of Genesis, you would think then that because God has destroyed the earth with a flood, and I'm sure Moses, I'm not Moses, Noah and his family told their descendants, hey, it's, there's only us. There were, there were more people. They're all gone now. Why are they gone? Dad? Grandpa? Well, they're gone because the earth was filled with violence, strife, contention, confusion. Couples couldn't get along. Churches, for our application, couldn't get along. And so this was a serious matter to God. God destroyed the earth. And you would think that would have been enough to put a fear of God in creation that people would work at being peacemakers. But it is so hard to do that by the time we get to chapter 8, God has to give us a covenant by, through a rainbow which has been hijacked by the alphabet community. Some call that community the alphabet community because it keeps extending. And I'm not saying it to even be funny or anything. It's just easier to say than LGBTQ and whatever other letters are being added. But they've hijacked the rainbow, which is a reminder to mankind that God is a holy God who will judge unrighteousness, but he is merciful. He tempers his wrath with mercy. And so he gives us a covenant to remind himself of, of, of the need to be temperate. Put that in our language. God needs nothing to remind him. But that helps us to understand God, just as God gives us memorials, God creates a rainbow to remind mankind, mm, I'm going to show mercy. The earth doesn't deserve mercy, but I will be a merciful God. And should, that, doesn't that encourage your heart this morning? It should. Bow with me in prayer then as we look at this text. And uh, I'm going to spend a few moments. I have six basic points. My intention was to have a overhead but my schedule didn't permit it. And I have to confess to you that I finished what I wanted to say probably a few minutes before I got here this morning. And sometimes when I'm teaching and preaching, that's what happens. I am not fully clear in what I believe the Lord would have me to say. And I usually get clarity at the last minute. It's like you when you are getting prepared to go on vacation. Somehow the day or two before vacation begins you somehow find a unique way to get all the work done that you couldn't complete for the last two weeks. You get it done 24 hours before vacation. I think there's something in setting deadlines or having deadlines that helps us to get more clarity and so on and so on. So that's not an excuse. That's just an explanation. Let's bow in prayer as we look at this text. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to look into the scriptures. Lord, this is something that is impossible for us to be and to live. And this is why your son said, blessed are the peacemaker makers. And I'm asking, Lord, I'm inviting your presence into our midst. And as we take these next 30 minutes or so, I'm asking that you would feed us, Lord, with food that is sufficient for us. You know where there is contention in our homes. You know where there is contention in our hearts. You know where there is contention in the workplace. Father, there is strife all through the earth. But we plead with you, O oh God, that you would break our minds and our hearts. As your word says there that we read there in Isaiah, Lord... The, 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 you, you, even though you are holy, you will have relationship with those who are lowly, those who are humble, those who recognize their need for you, their poverty of spirit. And we ask you to speak now and be glorified in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. All right, I have six points for you this morning. And uh, I have a clock here to remind myself I want to tell you that I have my own conscience, but I have another conscience, and her name is Deborah Isaacs, that reminds me that I, that I preach too long, uh, even though we've been married 20 years, she's heard me preach a thousand times, you preach too long, keep it short and, and brief, and I'm like, honey, this is just me, I don't know anything else. So Jason, I'm going to try to stick to my notes, and, uh, and, uh, and be a peacemaker. So, here is my six basic points for you this morning if you're writing them down. Number one, we're going to talk about the benefit of peacemakers, of being a peacemaker. The benefit. The benefit. Secondly, the, some misconceptions of peacemaking. A lot of people believe they know what peacemaking is, and everybody from Gandhi to Martin Luther to Nobel Peace Prize winners believe they know what it means to be a peacemaker because the whole world wants peace. But they don't want it righteously, always. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the meaning of peacemaker. 
Fourthly, the only model for peacemaking. There is one model you should follow. One model. And that's Christ himself. That's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Any area of my life, Paul says, that does not follow the King of kings and Lord of lords, don't follow that part of my life. Because every human being is imperfect, and many of us are grieving right now as the new uh, revelations of Ravi Zacharias' life. The only one to follow fully is Jesus Christ. Because this treasure is in earthen clay vessels. And God uses broken vessels. Number five, we'll look at the method of peacemaking. And then lastly, the identification for the peacemakers. The identification for the peacemakers. So, so first of all, the benefit of peacemakers. The benefit to, sorry, to peacemakers. In the text, right there and again, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm sorry, not 5, verse 9. I'm going to need my glasses today. I try to do it without it. I don't know if that's the vanity of life, right? I don't want to get older. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. First of all, I want you to see the benefit of uh, two peacemakers is they are described as those that are blessed. Now, I don't want you to take this word blessed for granted. The idea behind the Greek word for bless is to be happy. We live in a world of unhappy people. To be blessed is to have the favor of God on your life, which produces internal joy and happiness. I don't think you know anyone in the midst of strife, in the midst of contention, in the midst of war, that is happy right now. This text says, blessed are the peacemakers. In the truest sense, in the godly sense of the word, not in our modern sense of merely being comfortable and entertained, the word happy means to be complete, means to be satisfied, means to be content. And so when God says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, God is saying that is a very unique designation for creatures made in my image, to be called blessed. God is described as blessed. Blessed then has the idea of enjoying enviable happiness. Imagine that people look at your life and they envy the fact that they are not as happy or joyful or satisfied or as content as you are. That's what Jesus says is one of the favors of God on those who are peacemakers. Blessed, happy, enviably happy are those who are peacemakers. This has the idea of being spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation. Thursday morning, I was getting prepared to do a meeting with my team at work. And I got a call that morning that one of my team members, her uncle, committed suicide. He killed himself the night before. Now, the ironic thing is that Monday, he was talking to her father... And they spoke for 45 minutes to an hour. And there was no way that he could identify that this man was in such internal turmoil that he was prepared to take his life. Can you imagine you speak to someone on Monday and by Wednesday they take their life and there's nothing in that conversation for 45 minutes of this closest friend to you that you could determine that they lack internal peace? But there are millions of people in our world just like that right now. That's why God says, happy are the peacemakers. But it's not just the peacemakers. It's they that mourn. It's they that are poor in spirit. It's they that are merciful. All of the character traits that Jesus identifies in the text that that our good brother read reminds you and I that this is the character of God. So happy are the peacemakers. So the benefit to being a peacemaker is happy, blessed, spiritually prosperous, Satisfied with God's favor, regardless of your outward condition. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. This person is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Nothing moves them. Doesn't say, I didn't say nothing shakes them. I didn't say that nothing irritates them, but nothing moves them. 
because they are anchored to the rock. And that rock is Christ. Amen. Secondly, so we look at the benefit of peacemakers. Secondly, some misconceptions about peacemaking. There is a lot of talk about fighting for justice and how we need peace and so on and so on. And this has been a theme for at least the last hundred years. But I don't know if you know this, but I want to bring this truth to you. Honey, you don't mind bringing me that bottle of water, would you, please? That was, that's not what I want to bring to you. I just feel real thirsty. Um, in 4,000 years of recorded history, 4,000 years of recorded history, mankind has had over 8,000, uh, what do you call those things where countries agree they're not going to fight? Treaties. treaties. Over 8,000 treaties have been signed. In over 4,000 years... Right? Of recorded history. Just recorded. And all they can identify in 4,000 years of recorded history is a 280 to 300 years without war. Years that were peaceful. This is a serious issue. So, some misconceptions about peacemaking. Some believe that peacemaking is the absence of conflict. That's not the truth. Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Like Jesus, you sound like you're contradicting. Blessed are the peacemakers. No. The only time you don't fight for peacemaking is when you have to compromise the word of God. This is why the Bible says, pursue peace and holiness. You can't just pursue peace without holiness. That becomes ecumenical. That becomes compromise. You must pursue peace and holiness. But you cannot just pursue holiness. Or you begin to be lofty like God, but unlike God in being lowly. And so you are way up here and no one can relate to you because nobody is righteous or holy enough to be in your presence. And so God says pursue peace and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Sorry that I'm shouting. I feel like I'm shouting, but I feel it in my bones. So, first misconception is, this is not an absence of conflict. Peace in the Bible should not be confused with pacifism. Being pacified. We have a whole world right now in our nation that's telling people just be pacified. That's not biblical. Secondly, it's not the avoidance of strife only. To pursue, to be a peacemaker doesn't just mean avoid strife. Guess what? There are people that are pacifists by nature. By nature, they don't like conflict. So guess what? Nothing irritates them. Nothing frustrates them. Nothing bothers them. So they will never cleanse the temple. The point I want you to make is, the character that God is identifying is not something you can do on your own or I can do on my own. We can't will our way into this. We can't just learn it and become it. We have to be changed by His grace. We have to be changed by His presence. We have to hunger and thirst for it. It's called hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So it's not the avoidance of strife. Never are we told to avoid all conflict or strife. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no one is pursuing. See, the wicked avoids. I'm not talking about contention, but even responsibility or accountability. And sometimes when you seek to hold people accountable... It's going to feel like strife. It's going to feel contentious. When, when, when Paul looked Peter in the face, and other people are present in Galatians chapter 2, and he resists him steadfastly and strongly, that didn't feel good, I'm sure, to everybody around. But Paul says, Peter, stop sinning. You know better. He didn't say anything other than that. Correct what you're doing, because you're causing even Barnabas to go astray. By your compromise. And so it's not the avoidance of strife in general or by itself. Thirdly, it's not the appeasement of of parties. In other words, there is no such thing as peace at any price. You can never make everyone happy. There are some people who think being a peacemaker means that I just have to get along with everyone. Well, sometimes you can't get along with everyone. That's why Paul says in Romans, we're at all possible with with you. Be at peace with all men. Sometimes it's not possible. Jesus was called a wine bibber and a drunkard in Luke chapter 7, verse 34. It says, the Son of Man is come, neither eating or drinking. They had problems with John. 
Because John ate and drank. <clears throat> I'm sorry, John didn't eat and drink. John fasted. He lived a, a life of, 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 of fasting and prayer in the wilderness. Self-denial. That was John's life. Jesus was the opposite of John. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. He loved to feast and he loved to fast. And you say, Behold, look, he's a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. It doesn't matter if you are the Prince of Peace. It doesn't matter if your passion is for peace. People who don't want peace won't accept it. So you must be careful that it doesn't mean appeasement of all parties. Of parties. Therefore, lastly, it's not the accommodation of issues or you can't gloss over issues and act like they don't exist. Some people think being a peacemaker means I'm just going to cover everything you've said, everything you've done, and we won't hold you accountable. But if I really love you, I want you to be the best you that you can be. If I really love you, I want you to bring glory to God by your living. And so these are some misconceptions about peacemaking. Thirdly, well, what is the meaning of peacemaking? Look at the text again. It says, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Notice that Jesus does not say, blessed, blessed are those who have peace. He doesn't say, blessed are they that are peaceful. He doesn't say, blessed are those that are acting peacefully. He does not say, blessed are the peace wishers, the peace hopers, the peace dreamers, the peace talkers, or the peace lovers. All those are great virtuous things. But this is harder than all of them. You can love peace, you can desire peace, you can talk about peace. You can, even, you can even desire to be peaceful. But to be a peacemaker requires much more. That's why he says, blessed are the peacemakers. That means you have to make peace. And that's very difficult to do. Because people don't like to get along. Don't you agree? People don't like to get along. From board meeting to house meeting, people don't like getting along. Because the problem with mankind is oh, every man is right where? In his own eyes. Even Christians. We're all right in our own eyes. And so in order to be a peacemaker, guess what? There will be times where you will choose to deny yourself. You'll choose to be defrauded. You will not fight just for your right. Because being a peacemaker at that point is more important. We'll talk about that in a moment. So peace must be made. Peace never happens by chance. This does not describe those who live in peace but those who actually bring about peace, overcoming evil with good. To be a peacemaker means that you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Means that you are actively looking for opportunities online and offline to bring peace into situations. Understanding that it requires supernatural power of God, wisdom of God, grace of God, to reconcile differences between people and between people and God. People and people and people in God. A working definition of peacemaker is someone who is actively seeking to reconcile people to God, actively seeking, and to reconcile people to people. That means if you have a of friends that are married, that is a couple, if you're a peacemaker, you are going to be grieved and burdened if they have enmity. And you are going to pray for them and you're going to seek to get them to see that that separation is not the answer if you want to please God fully. Peacemaking is hard, don't you agree? It is very difficult to do. The word make, peacemakers, the term peacemakers, the word that you use in peacemakers comes from the Greek verb that means to do or to make. It is a word bursting with energy. It... <clears throat> It mandates action and initiative. To be a peacemaker is not easy. That's why he doesn't begin with blessed are the peacemakers. And notice he doesn't say the peacemakers will inherit heaven or inherit the earth as the meek. All of these are distinctives. They're important. They should be character traits of the people of God, though maybe not fully, but at least we should have this as part of our life. But to be a peacemaker means that I have to be intentional. It means perfect. The idea of it is a, it, it, it is, um, sorry. Sometimes it has the word make here. It is, it is bursting with energy. It mandates action and initiative. And it has the idea of someone that has to drag 
the combatants to the table and give them a reason to put down their arms. That's the image in the, in the Greek, the original language. To be a peacemaker is God having to take on human flesh and come down to the earth, Ephesians 2, and reconcile the Jew and the Gentile where there is war between them. They want nothing to do with each other. And God was in Christ reconciling them. That's an example of a peacemaker. So when these two words are taken together, peacemakers, peace has the idea of shalom, right? To behold, it is a broad term related to health, prosperity, harmony, and wholeness. When you bring these two words together, peace and maker, it describes one who actively pursues peace. The peacemaker pursues more than the absence of conflict. They don't avoid strife. In fact, sometimes peacemaking will create strife, though that's not its intention. They aren't merely seeking to appease the warring parties. They aren't trying to accommodate everyone. Instead, they are pursuing all the beauty and blessedness of God upon another person. William Barclay, on this phrase, peacemakers, translates the verse this way. They are people who produce right relationships in every sphere of life. They are people who produce, just like God produces. They're in His image, and they're not just praying, God, you do it. They're saying, God, how can I be used to do it? They are peacemakers. They're not just praying about it. They're not just asking for it. They are saying, here I am, Lord, Isaiah 6, send me. Fourthly, the only model for peacemaking, or the best model for peacemaking, is Christ himself. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Jesus is the best model for everything. Jesus is the best model for everything, for every virtue. Right? When I say everything, I mean everything that is holy, everything that is virtuous. In Ephesians chapter 2, we find an example of Christ as the model for all peacemakers. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. We have this, it says, for he, Jesus, is our peace. Now, what has he done to be our peace? Who has made both one. He's brought unity between two relationships. He's brought down the wall between two fighting parties, two parties that are against each other. And he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Verse 15 says he's abolished in his flesh, but pick up at verse 16. And he that, well, why did he do this? That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. In other words, Jesus has destroyed the enmity that would, the enmity, the hostility that was between Jew and God, Gentile and God, and Gentile and Jew. Jesus has destroyed the walls between man and man, and man and God. And his desire is that they would be one, meaning there is no strife, no hostility between them. And he is the best example of peacemaking. It says, what did he do? In verse 17, he came and what did he preach? He came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. See, to bring peace, to be a peacemaker, you bring people together. You take that which is far, that, that grandfather and that son-in-law that haven't talked in 20 years. It's not enough if they are still alive for me not to be grieved by the wall between them. I didn't say we can change them. But see, when we are grieved, we mourn. The second part of the Beatitudes is first, blessed are the poor in spirit. The second part is, blessed are they that mourn. Jesus is not talking about physical mourning in the sense that I had a loved one die. He's talking about mourning over spiritual things, mourning over sin. Sin in my life, the sin in other people's lives. Blessed are they that mourn. They will be comforted. And so, Jesus tore down walls. And he is a great example. And I hope you see that this is impossible to do without Christ. This is impossible to do without Christ. And that's what I want you to feel. For he himself is our peace. One writer says, it must be noted that Christ did not simply bring peace. He became our peace. John MacArthur shares a story about a World War II to illustrate how Christ is our peace. Here's the story that John MacArthur shared. 
He says, during World War II, a group of American soldiers were exchanging fire with some Germans who occupied a farmhouse. The family who lived in the house had run to, to the, bur- the barn for protection. Suddenly, their little three-year-old daughter became frightened, and she ran out into the field between the two groups of soldiers. The American soldiers, the German soldiers, are fighting to kill each other. they got to defend their space. I don't blame them. And all of a sudden, a three-year-old runs in the middle of all of this and watch the outcome. When they saw the little girl, both sides immediately ceased firing until she was safe. A little child brought peace, brief as it was, as almost nothing else could have done. Jesus is the model for our peace. There is benefits to being a peacemaker. There are misconceptions about, about, about what it means to be a peacemaker. There is the meaning of peacemaking or the peacemaker. But fifthly, what is the method of peacemaking? This is very difficult, so how do we do it? Go back to Matthew chapter 5, please. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. How do, we, how do we become peacemakers? Well, I said to you, you and I can't will this. We can't make it happen. What we, have to, what we need is the pattern that's found in the Beatitudes. What we need is to have enough disagreements with our spouse and see that as sin, that it puts us in our prayer closet to, to recognize our poverty of spirit where we mourn over our lack of righteousness and holiness. What we need is enough situations that show us how flawed we are, how weak we are in ourself, that it creates the reminder that we are poor and we are needy, so we go to the one who has all power. Look with me, please, at verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5. It is believed by many, and I included, that these Beatitudes are not built, these are not, Jesus didn't just haphazardly just throw these out. These build one upon another. So the first thing says, blessed are the poor in spirit. It doesn't say blessed are the physically poor. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Who is poor in spirit? A person who has nothing, knows nothing, and and, and believe they can do nothing without God. I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing. Guess what? Doesn't matter if you walked with God for 30 years, you will always have reminders that you are nothing. You have nothing. Every time I have an argument with my wife, I think we had one, was it yesterday or the day before? It was recent. I, remind, I am reminded that I am nothing, Jason. I can do nothing. I need to be connected to the vine. And that is an active verb. I have to go back to him over and over. That's why he says, pray what? Give us this day our daily bread. Doesn't matter if I had enough bread yesterday to sustain me, to hold me, to keep me strong. What? That means nothing. Give us this day our daily bread. Every day I go back to the source. I recognize my poverty. I'm not saying I, I'm saying us. Every day we do that. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, they shall be comforted. Secondly, blessed are they that mourn. What are they mourning over? They're mourning over the fact that they still fight with sin in their life. They still fight with sin in others. They don't like to see broken relationships between family members. They are mourning for, over this. They're not mourning because they lost a the car. They're crying because they lost the car. This morning is spiritual mourning. The third, the third part is because we have mourned, because we understand we're nothing, it develops a meekness in how we interact with other people. Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. Do you think maybe he was the meekest man that ever lived because he committed murder? Do you believe maybe he understood what he was capable of and that created a sense of meekness in how he interacted with other people? There's a difference between meekness and gentleness. Gentleness is an action. Meekness is a disposition. Jesus was meek and lowly of heart. Meekness is a disposition. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Meekness in the text is gentleness and meekness. Meekness is not something I can create on my own. It's something that's developed when I've mourned over my condition and I've said, Lord, forgive me for fighting again with my spouse. Forgive me for raising my, my voice at my children. Forgive me for embarrassing your name in the board meeting, Jesus. See, when we mourn over our sin, then God creates in us a sense of meekness. 
And God says those who are dealing with sinners in the church have to be those who are spiritually minded. Listen to the text. Galatians 6, 2. It says, if, not 2, it says, If a man be overtaken in a fault, let those who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Why? Considering their self. See, meekness is created because you know what you are capable of. Amen. Everybody understand that? That's why some of the most some of the people that are most fire for God, in general terms, are people who have come from the most evil and wickedness in their past. John Newton is a good example. Right? So meekness. But the fourth thing you have to develop this is that meekness in that morning and that poverty of spirit makes you hungry and thirsty for something. You're not hungry and thirsty for a bigger car and bigger house and prosperity. No, you want righteousness. The goal of the gospel is to be righteous. It is not just to put on the righteousness of Jesus. Putting on the righteousness of Jesus produces the righteousness of Jesus. That's why John says in 1 John 3, All that doeth righteousness are righteous. That's why 1 Timothy says, All doctrine is profitable for instruction and correction in righteousness. The goal of, the, of teaching is to make us righteous in our actions, righteous in our behavior. I'm way past. I'm not way past, but I realize I have one more point, so let me bring it all in. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus says, if you recognize your state of poverty, you don't like the fact that you still at times use bad words. You, don't, you know oh, no evil communication should be come out of your mouth, but Lord, it did it, I did it again. You understand that being angry, and that you can be angry, but be angry and sin not. Not all anger is sin, but to be angry without cause is sin. And you know, you know what? That was not a righteous cause. That was not a God-honoring cause. That was self-centered. Why I got angry? Forgive me, Lord. And you do it twice. You do it three times. That should create a mourning. That should create a sense of poverty. That should create a desire. Lord, I want to be like you. That's the hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Then there is the merciful. A person who knows their poverty, who are mourning over their sin, who have developed meekness in how they interact with God and others, because they deserve nothing, they are nothing, have nothing, who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, they are now able to show mercy towards others. And then those who are merciful, he then says, blessed are the pure in heart. You've gone through some cleansing. You've gone through, Lord... Cleanse me, make me clean. I want to be like you. And then there's purity of heart. Then there's peacemakers. So here's the method of peacemaking. The first thing you and I should do when there is situations where we want to bring peace is we should pray. <clears throat> that goes without saying, right? Uh, Proverbs 3 says we should acknowledge God, acknowledge God in all of our ways. Everything we should acknowledge God for. I pray for parking spots. You may think that's funny. I pray for parking spots and I get them all the time. Now, the person next to me may be praying and they didn't get it. I, that has nothing to do with me. I don't, I, I don't know what they're praying about. I'm just going to be like a little child. Luke 8, uh, Matthew 18. Right? And I'm going to pray about everything. That's what you should do. So the first thing we should do if we see a situation where there is strife and contention and confusion, let's pray. Secondly, we have to take initiative. Look down in this same passage in Matthew chapter 5. I want you to look down, please, <clears throat> to verse... 23. Peacemaking is often more important than worship. Peacemaking can be more important than worship. Verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember there your brother has ought against you. This is why this is so difficult. God doesn't say you remember you have a problem against that person. God expected you to deal with that already. But if you remember someone has ought against you, God says, I don't want your worship. I don't want your singing. I don't want your Bible reading. I want you to leave your gift to me, which I would, I would love. I want you to leave it at the altar. I want you to go first and seek to be reconciled with your brother. Verse 24. Imagine how this would impact marriages. Some of you saw me on the phone at 1030. At 1030, I got a call. A couple that I married many, many years ago the wife is crying uncontrollably. They had a huge fight. And I can't take this no more, was her response. 
And I'm sitting there thinking, how much of this can I deal with now? I got to get ready to go into the service. I mean, I got to get ready to, to, you know, the service, the music is playing. The service is about to start. And I'm trying to console her and him. I text both of them. Don't do nothing yet. Stay away from each other right now. And wait until I can call you back. This stuff is real. Marriage is difficult, isn't it? Marriage is difficult. 27 years of marriage, and I am still saying, God, I'm still learning this woman. And she's saying, God, why did I marry this guy? That sounds, you know, my learning the woman sounds, you know, her, her, her thing sounds a little bit uh, more, uh, puts me down a little bit, which I wanted. So this text says in verse 24, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to thy brother. How in the world could Jesus be the Prince of Peace? Every letter in the New Testament begins with grace and peace be multiplied. Peace is critical to every aspect of our life and we not be peacemakers. Something is desperately wrong in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ if God's people are not initiating and grieving over the lack of unity and peace among those who profess to love God. This text says we should take initiative. Peace can be more important than worship. And there are times when we need to wait to worship to go and correct that issue. You have the same idea in 1 Peter chapter 3. God says, husbands, don't have fights with your wives. Deal with those issues. Why? Because your prayers will be hindered. God says, I won't answer your prayers if you and your wife are not reconciled. Your prayers will go to the ceiling and no further. And if you love God, I think you want your prayers to be answered. Especially when you get diagnosed with a terminal disease. I still believe he heals those. Number three, pray, take initiative. Thirdly, be conscious of your approach. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. This is why meekness comes before being a peacemaker. If you don't understand your own poverty of spirit... If there is not a sense of, I don't deserve anything nice from this person, you go into that expectation expecting that they better do what I say, they better correct the issue, or else. God does not have that approach with anyone in this building. God is merciful. The Bible even says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom, but His goodness leads us to repentance. And so... Be conscious of your approach. Lastly, the scripture again says in Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. You know what wrath is? Wrath is anger on steroids. Wrath is the highest level of anger. God says a soft answer can turn that away. But you won't pray and develop a soft answer if you don't believe what God says. Number four, don't talk about people that have hurt you to other people talk to them. This, I think, is one of the greatest sins, respectable sins. There's a great book called Respectable Sins. This is one of the sins of the people of God. One of the things you see identified all through the scriptures is God condemns tail-bearing, gossip, whisper, backbiting. The sins of the mouth are uh, um, many. I wanted to find a big word, but many. (laughs) There are a lot of different sins of the mouth that are identified. And what a lot of people do is when they get hurt by people, they go to other people instead of going to the person. How many of you, by raise of hands, have been offended by somebody, and when you approached them, they had no clue they offended you? That's biblical. The Bible says, there. see, our perceptions are not always reality. Just because I interpreted an offense doesn't mean they intended to offend me. And I should not deal with someone, I should deal differently with someone who intended to offend me than someone who did not intend. Even God does that with us. His word, as we learned Wednesday night, we were reminded, it discerns both the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why does God discern both? Because those are valuable to God when He is judging. God doesn't just look at actions, God looks at why we acted. So, The method of peacemaking is to pray. We must take initiative. Be conscious of your approach. And don't talk to people about people. And I mean that in context of, I mean, if you're going to somebody for wisdom or insight or counsel, that's different. But the reality is, is a lot of people talk about people to other people without going to the person that they have been offended by. 
All right. And lastly, back to Matthew five, verse nine. Look at the text again. Blessed are the peacemakers for they, they, you can say they and they alone shall be called the children of God. You say, who's calling them the children of God? I say, God is calling them the children of God and the world calls them the children of God. The world can recognize in a peacemaker that that person is different from me. That person is different from what's normal. And maybe you may take for granted this idea of being called the children of God. I want you to go with me, please, to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. As we close. 1 John 3. I told my wife I'm going to try to do 35 or 40 minutes. I'm like 40, almost 45 minutes. I tried. I tried. I normally preach for an hour or so. This is, this is you know, it takes God's grace. And uh, maybe a little bit better organization on my part. First John chapter 3. Look at verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever does righteousness, does not righteousness, is not of God. Neither he that loves not his brother. So the children of God and the children of doubt, the devil. There are two groups of people as far as God is concerned. We're either a child of God or a child of the devil. There's no neutral. But an identifier of those who are the children of God is that they do righteousness. They do righteousness. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. This is an identification for them. The reward, <clears throat> the reward of peacemakers is that they are recognized as true children of God. They share God's passion for peace, His passion for reconciliation, the breaking down of walls between people. The, 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 the idea here is to be called the children of God is, to, is one who is like his family. This is a statement of character. This person bears the marks of their family. They resemble the reputation of their father. So as we close, I have a couple quick questions for you. Number one, do people in your life recognize the family resemblance based on your efforts of peacemaking? Do people that are closest to you and your family, can they say that in some small sense, you act like your father? As Jesus says, as he ends chapter 5, he says, Love your enemies and be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You say, oh God, that's a high standard. Yes, it is. We fall short of his glory. But if you don't, fall, if you don't recognize falling short of his glory and the standard is high, you don't recognize your poverty of spirit. Then you don't mourn. And then God don't develop fruit in the life. See, it's that mourning over our sinful state or condition that provides an opportunity for God to give us more of His grace, more of His Spirit, so that we can walk in the Spirit and not pursue the lusts or desires of the flesh. So do people in your life recognize the family resemblance based on your efforts of peacemaking? Secondly, are you actively seeking to reconcile people to God and to one another? If you're not, you say, God, help me to be more aware of my responsibility. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. As I close, Hebrews 12, verse 14, says this. I want to leave this with you. <clears throat> I quoted it earlier. But showing again that this is not a suggestion of the Lord. This is a command. Verse 14 of Hebrews 12 says, Follow or pursue or follow after peace with some men. No. It says with all men. God, I have to pursue peace with homosexuals? Yep. I have to pursue peace if I have a relative that committed an abortion or whatever the thing is that I may think is the worst sin that someone can commit. God says, yes, you still have to be, pursue peace. That doesn't mean you condone sin, doesn't mean you cover sin, but guess what? Love still covers a multitude of sins. And God is covering my sin and your sin on a regular basis. The psalmist said, if God were to mark our iniquities, what are iniquities? It doesn't say sins, doesn't say transgressions. Iniquities begin inside. Sin is to transgress the Lord. And he, he that knoweth to do good, to him it is sin. But, tra but iniquity is something that's not always obvious. It is a bent, even in disposition, towards a thing. That's iniquity. The psalmist says, if God were to keep track of that, in our life, my life, not one person in this building would be able to stand in His presence. And see, that is the only 
understanding of Bible and God that creates the attitude among the people of God to become and be peacemakers. This text says, follow after peace with all men and holiness without which no man, no woman, no boy, no girl shall see the Lord. Don't be comfortable with your children not being peacemakers. Oh, they just fight because they're kids. Okay. What would happen if you saw that five-year-old daughter as a future wife? Because you are training her up. And that five-year-old, if developing, slamming the door with a bad attitude, what does that look like when she's 27, slamming the door with a bad attitude? That sounds like a possible divorce. I'm not saying it should be. I'm just saying, if you see your children as little adults in development... If I see them, then there's things that we laugh at, that we think are not a big deal, that we would say, Lord, you said, when we rise up, when we lie down, when we wake up in the morning, we're in the way. I was talking to my family yesterday. I'm like, you see how hard it is to teach the Bible? God says from morning until night, parents should be putting the example and the teaching of God in front of their children. And all of us fall short. And God says that is what it takes to change hearts. So that's my word this morning. Thank you for being patient. Let's bow in prayer. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to write these things on our hearts. And Lord, these folks don't know me. As we were reminded Wednesday night, your word is a two-edged sword. And before I gave your word to them, you gave it to me. And you dealt with my heart. And I pray, Lord, that that work that you have done and are doing will last, that it would not be temporal. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would give us grace to desire to be peacemakers, to pursue it, and to live out this this for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. amen.